Welcome back everyone after the uh, short break and uh, once again I re reiterate my words of thanks to Rabbi Kim Khi. Um, now absolutely delighted to be able to hand over to uh, Rabbi Michael Pollock. Um, I mentioned actually when I introduced Rabbi Kim Khi about the uh, small group of remarkable lay leaders who uh, shared in the vision and the idea and the concept that became Nei Yisrael and uh, a very important part of the history of our community uh, was through Rabbi Michael Pollock um, not just a lay leader, but a, a Talmud Chochom, a man of learning and a dazzling intellect. Um, Rabbi Pollock also uh, edited and put together the, uh, one of the fest shrifts that was uh, um, assembled and uh, put together at the time of the retirement of Rabbi Sachs. Um, in fact, uh, I don't know if you know this, but um, in the introduction, Michael, that you wrote to this uh, fest shrift, uh, you actually once caused me significant problems on a Yom Kippur. And uh, the background is that... Uh, on Yom Kippur in, uh, here in Nei Yisrael, we, we take a short break uh, between uh, Musaf, the end of Musaf, and the start of Mincha, when many people traditionally put their heads down on the table and, and get a little bit of a rest before we uh, carry on with renewed uh, kach and energy to daven on Yom Kippur. And it's certainly not good practice to uh, uh, make a noise at that point. Now, it was uh, Yom Kippur afternoon, and uh, we were taking this break, and uh, I wasn't able to uh, rest. So I, my hand uh, went to the book, the Feshrith, that you had compiled um, in honor of Rabbi, uh, in honor of Rabbi Sachs. And uh, I read your introduction to this uh, Feshrith, at which point I burst out laughing and woke up everyone else in the room and uh, my, made myself quite unpopular at that point. So uh, without dictating to you, uh, Michael, what you should speak about today, I, I would very much appreciate it if you could perhaps share that story then the introduction to the, the first shift, uh, that story of, uh, that you shared about Rabbi Sachs. Now, um, Michael, you'll be speaking about uh, the topic of how Jewish is Jewish philosophy. An absolutely central question carries on actually very nicely the theme that Rabbi Kimchi started, in which he spoke about uh, Rabbi Sachs as an exponent of Jewish philosophy. But actually, do Jews do philosophy? Is this our way of relating to Torah? Is this our way of serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Um, or is it more about halacha and mitzvahs? So a, a very important uh, topic, something that definitely deserves addressing, and one uh, perhaps central to part of the message of Rabbi Sachs. So uh, Rabbi Michael Pollock, Michael, really looking forward to uh, hearing your, your thoughts and your share today. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and for sharing this. Thank you very much, Rab Rabbi Zobin. Um, uh, he's asked me to tell a story which I think I've promised not to tell ever again but um, I think I've had more than my money's worth out of this one story. But um, if requested, I, I feel I have to tell it. And it will link into very much what um, Rabbi Kimchi was saying before and maybe into something that I will say later. So here goes the story. Um, you have to imagine you're in 1976. Um, we're all ever so slightly younger, and particularly Rabbi Sachs wasn't yet Rabbi Sachs. He was Dr. Sachs. But he was his trajectory was very much towards um, taking a leading communal view uh, position, and he decided that it would be a very good idea to bring together a group of um, young men who had some expertise in um, rabbinic canon, in particularly in, in Talmud, binti yeshivas, and also who had some familiarity with philosophy. Uh, when I got to see the room. Um, I think the familiar, familiarity with philosophy went as far as knowing that philosophy isn't spelt with two Fs. Anyhow, he, he told us that he was going to lead the first session. Uh, he was undoubtedly the cleverest person in the room, so we had no objections to that. But our hearts started trembling when he told us the topic of this um, lecture, discussion, paper he was going to read us. It was on the importance of Wittgenstein's later philosophy in understanding Jewish theology. Well, I think a large number of people just decided to go to sleep there and then. I hung on in there for about 15 minutes when thoughts of my next wonderful meal overwhelmed the importance of Wittgenstein's later philosophy. And I do recall even thinking about the goals that I was planning to score in an FA Cup final. So, but my quarter of an hour, was, I'm sure, was longer than anyone else's. After 75 minutes, he sat down triumphantly and thanked us all, all for listening, absolutely unaware that he'd missed his audience by about 100 miles. And the host um, of the evening, uh, who had spent many years in Gateshead Yeshiva and some years in Mir Yeshiva, um, 
who certainly didn't appreciate the topic and the use of jargon and the technical language and got up and spoke in Yiddish for 15 minutes. Um, Rabbi Sachs, ever polite and very much trained in the language of Oxbridge, said, I I'm terribly sorry, David, but um, I didn't take Yiddish, so I didn't really understand what you were saying. To which the host triumphantly resp re responded, well, now you know how we felt for the last 75 minutes. Um, now, the importance of, of, of the story is twofold. We'll see that the material he went over, uh, he, he introduced us to, actually has an importance in the history of Jewish philosophy, that and non, but more significantly, um, it's the last time I ever heard him miss an audience. He learned the lesson that in addition to having fantastic content, you have to be able to hit the bullseye with regards to your audience. And uh, Rabbi Kimchi mentioned it. If you don't understand who the audience of any one of his particular books are, then you don't understand the book. So uh, Morality is, is unfortunately the last book that will, that will come out, um, edited by him. Um, and Morality has very few Jewish references and isn't for a Jewish audience. It's for a, a totally non-Jewish audience. If you um, roll back and get to, say, um, Politics of Hope, Politics of Hope has a lot of Jewish sources and has a message both for a Jewish audience and a, and a non-Jewish audience. So it's not that there were many different Rabbi Sachses. There was a Rabbi Sachs who really worked on understanding his audience and making sure that he was able to um, put the material together in an incredibly su suitable way for his audience. So I, I'm sure I'll come back to Rabbi Sachs, but meanwhile, let's get to the, 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 the main topic. And the main topic um, is how Jewish is Jewish philosophy? So I tell my A-level students to define their terms in the introduction. So I won't be quite as formulaic as that, but let, let's discuss what is philosophy? What is philosophy? And here I will go back to, to Rabbi Sachs. He very kindly did a 10-minute video, to which I show at the beginning of every year's philosophy studies. And, and he asked, what is philosophy? And he comes up with this uh, lovely little phrase, which is thinking about thinking. Whatever it is you think it's worth thinking about, so you may want to think about God, or you may want to think about yourself, what you are. You may want to think about what's the best society. You may want to think about what a good government is. Whatever serious thinking, wherever serious thinking takes you, philosophy asks you to think about that thinking. Is it a, is it a good idea? Um, why is it a good idea? I think it's a very useful, um, very useful f phrase. And if anyone wants to see the 10 minute video, I'm very happy to, to, to send it on. It's a very good, brief introduction to, to Jewish philosophy. And let's just discuss what philosophy isn't. Um, and to illustrate what philosophy isn't, um, and certainly Jewish philosophy isn't, uh, I'll, I'll take the famous story that T.S. Eliot told, that he, uh, T.S. Eliot, famous anti-Semite, but um, he doesn't get mentioned in, in Jewish uh, lectures and shiro and all that often, so this is a bit of a one-off for, for T.S. Eliot. Um, Eliot gets into a cab in London, and the cab driver says, oh, you're that poet, T.S. Eliot, aren't you? And Eliot says, yes, yes, I am. And the cabbie says, oh, I get lots of celebrities in this cab. And Eliot says, yes, that's very nice. He said, oh, uh, only last week I had that Bertrand Russell. I had that Bertrand Russell, that famous philosopher, in my cab. And Eliot says, yeah, great. Um, and the cabbie says, and do you know what? I didn't know anything about philosophy. I asked him, I said, you, Bertrand Russell, greatest philosopher of the 20th century, well, tell me, what's it all about then? And Bertrand Russell says, well, I don't really, don't really know. He didn't know. He's less of a philosopher than I am, says the cabbie triumphantly to T.S. To Eliot. Well, whether the story happened or not, the point of the story is, what's it all about then is not a question that philosophers can, can answer. Um, and definitely you won't see anything remotely answering the what's it all about question in Jewish philosophy, because I think most 
serious Jewish thinkers will tell you what's it all about then is a very simple answer, which is Tariyad Mitzvahs. Um, and uh, there is no simple formula. And although we live in a world where lots of people are trying to sell simple formulas for the meaning of life, it's definitely something that has never really appealed to, to Jewish thinkers. So what I'm going to do, I think, I hope, is I'm going to show you that historically there have been three approaches to Jewish philosophy. Um, and I'm starting Jewish philosophy really with the Rambam. Um, there is an argument that, uh, that, that Sadia Gon and maybe earlier people were involved in philosophy, but it's clearly the Rambam himself who has, is conscious that he wants to think about thinking. So um, he, will, he will be our, our starting point. Um, I'm going to share the screen some of the time. So um, um, I hope everyone is now able to see that. Um, just a quick um, illustration. That was uh, Bertrand Russell. Which, um, and now I think the characterization of the early takes on Jewish philosophy, going back to the Rambam and onwards through the Middle Ages, is what we would call today apologetics, that we're trying to use, or they were trying to use, secular philosophy to enhance, to impress uh, a wider audience, or maybe even an internal audience. But it was about bringing in ideas that were already established in the secular world and adding them to Jewish thought and in some way making the Jewish thought more compelling. And why not start at the beginning? This is the first halacha of Hilchas Yisodia Torah, the first section of the Rambam's Mishnah Torah. And he wants to tell us that we have to know that God exists. And how do we know God exists? So Yisodia Yisodia is for Omud HaChochmos. And I'd ask you to remember that, that phrase, because it's going to be important later on. The um, foundation of foundations and Omud HaChochmos and the, the pillar of wisdom, um, which spells out Yud Ke Vov Ke. So Rambam wants, to know this, wants you to know that this is about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Later, Sheyesh Sham Matsui Rishon. And the Rambam picks out a phrase which anyone who, have, who has read some philosophy will know what he's talking about. A Matsui Rishon is the first being. A first being is not particularly, well, I'd say not at all a Jewish idea. The Rambam wants to import one of the, or some of the proofs that would have been known to Muslim philosophers, um, distilled maybe out of Aristotle. But this isn't a Jewish thought. The idea of a first being is we clearly have evidence that there's a world around us. Um, nothing happens without some cause for it happening. Um, there can't be an infinite regress of causes, otherwise there'd be nothing happening. Therefore, there must be this first being, which is unlike anything else. This first being isn't caused by anything else. Um, it's, a, it's a unique being. It's what we call God and he causes all beings to be. So the Rambam starts off right at the beginning of his most important work, Mishnah Torah. And in the Mishnah Torah, he says, I'm going to start with giving you what we might call a Goyish idea, a non-Jewish idea, because the Rambam thinks that by bringing in non-Jewish ideas, he is at least embellishing, if not bringing real solidity to Jewish ideas. Now, you may want to argue, ah, but the Rambam's audience are, are flaky. Uh, but that's not true. If this was in the Moen of Ruchim, I would agree with you that there is, that, to an extent, this is for an audience of people who aren't fully committed, and it's a very good pedagogic tool to, to appeal to wider philosophy. But this is Mishnah Torah. Um, the, the, the Rambam, this, this, if anywhere, the Rambam is speaking as himself, and the Rambam himself thinks it helps understanding Jewish thought to quote an outside, um, a purely non-Jewish idea. So um, how Jewish is Jewish philosophy? Well, at this stage, you'd have to say how Jewish is Jewish philosophy? Not that, not that it's a terrible thing, um, but it, it is resting very heavily, 
Um, um, make the screen bigger. Um, it is resting very heavily on non-Jewish sources. And I'll give you another really remarkable example of this. This is um, a few centuries after the, we're, we're into the 15th century and the Abarbanel. Uh, Barbanel was uh, a, a great admirer of the Rambam, Neshe HaGodel, as he was called, called by then, the Great Eagle. And this is the Abarbanel talking about reincarnation. And you'd have thought, you know, what, what's philosophy got to say about reincarnation? So um, the Abarbanel explains that reincarnation is, the un is how we understand the story of Yehuda and Tamar, and here, have a look at these names. These are, we don't have to go through it in, in, in great detail, but these, um, this is how the Ababanel finally supports this idea of reincarnation. And he says, Vigam kadmone ha philosophian. And the earliest philosophers, hayudatam tire ze hayodatam, they also thought that there was such a thing as um, reincarnation. Tereze Medivre, who's this? Socrat Ha'eloki. An amazing phrase. We're going to learn this from Socrates, but it's not any old Socrates. It's, it's the divine, the saintly, however you translate Eloki, it's pretty good high praise. And if I told you in the paragraph before, um, um, the Ababnel talks about Shim Bayachai, who is also Eloki. Um, the Adjective Eloki appears before the name Shim Bayachai, which may be a higher usage, but certainly Socrates is being introduced here because he's hugely important. And the person who writes down what Socrates has to say is this gentleman who, when I first read it, I read it as someone called Appleton, and I couldn't understand who on earth Appleton was, and I searched through philosophy books, and if the penny finally dropped, this is Aplaton, which is actually a better reflection of the Greek name for Plato. And Plato writes down Socrates' thoughts on the subject of reincarnation. And if you haven't got the point yet, then the next gentleman, who is from a much earlier period, but we, we know him for his square on the side of the hypotenuse, he calls the sum of the square the other two sides. And if you haven't worked out who he is yet, he is Pythagoras. And Pythagoras as well is someone who is going to support this idea of reincarnation. So again, the, the, the Ababnel, very much following the Rambam, sees the role of Jewish philosophy to import well-established ideas from other cultures, here Greek culture, and use it to support Jewish ideas. Just on the, on the issue of reincarnation, there is something that's always intrigued me. And if someone... Uh, wishes to have a have a stab at this I'd, I'd be very grateful but there's a tremendous coincidence if you look at the story of Yehuda and Tamar which even going back to the Ramban is predicated on the idea of reincarnation the right um, Tamar had to ensure that her first husband's um, soul could come back into this world in a in a suitable body and therefore insisted that Yehuda, his father, would be the person who would be the father of, of, of this son eventually. But one of the brothers who, um, who's involved in the story is someone called Er, as the second brother, I think. Um, now, if you look at Plato and his tale of reincarnation, it's all around a soldier called Er. It's exactly the same name. Two letters, E-R, um, or Ayn Reish. I'm not quite sure what the chances of a coincidence are, um, but I think we, we, if we like cultural triumphalism, we could through this air connection. So Plato tells this story that a soldier dies in battle and they lay his body out to be, um, to, 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 to be burnt in a funeral pyre. And just before they light the fire, he wakes up and he says, don't burn me, don't burn me, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I've been traveling the spiritual world and I have to tell you all about reincarnation. The messenger is someone called Air. Um, so I think there's a reasonable possibility that um, the name Air entered 
from from um, the Chumash into uh, common usage, and that's why Plato picked it for this particular topic, or not. I don't know if anyone uh, has any thoughts. I'd be re really grateful. It is quite a coincidence, anyhow. So this is this is how we're characterizing that period of time. Um, Jewish philosophy was a magpie. It took great ideas from elsewhere, imported them into Judaism, not only as a pedagogic tool to be able to persuade people that Judaism is, is right on and it's where, where things are, but because that um, was a good, a, a good way of explaining internally as well um, how to understand these ideas. You, you may be familiar, there's a Ramban right at the beginning of Parshas Bereshis, where the Ramban talks about tohu vavohu, that seemingly the world was um, uh, uh, chaos, and I'm not quite sure how we translate tohu vavohu, or, or, um, void and, and chaotic, perhaps. And the Ramban explains w what was that state. I mean, if it existed, then it couldn't have been empty. Um, it, if it was something, what was it? And again, the Ramban borrows an idea from, from Greek cosmology that there's this um, substance, um, sort of blobby, non-formed substance called Huli, and he talks about the, the, the Huli. I mean, he may have been uncomfortable with it, but he, he understands the imp that for those days it was very important to try and use um, external philosophies for, for Jewish purposes. Um, and even into the modern period, this kind of apologetics um, is pretty current. Well, pretty current. This goes back to 1976. 1976, this is the Proceedings of the Association of Orthodox Jewish Scientists, whose message in life is, look at science, don't worry, science and Judaism, science and Orthodox Judaism are walking absolutely step in step. Now, the reason I've got this up on the screen is that this particular edition has nothing less than um, what we have over here is the formal write-up of the article based on the 1976 shear that I heard from, we heard from Jonathan Sachs on this very topic of the significance of Wittgenstein's later philosophy. Now, um, just as a, a, a biographical note, can I just refer you to the um, thing at the bottom? So this is, he's still, I'm afraid, only Dr. Jonathan Sachs, and he's a lecturer in philosophy at Jews College in London. His article is entitled Philosophy and the Language of Religion. So it's going to have something to do with Wittgenstein. Um, but it sparked some heated debate among members of the editorial board and consultant reviewers. So we've elected to publish Dr. Sachs' paper in its original form, but we must point out that the views expressed are solely those of the author and do not necessarily represent those of the AOJS. So if you think that the first time um, Rabbi Sachs uh, ha had ran into trouble with the Orthodox establishment was over the dignity of difference, um, or letters um, about ref uh, liberal rabbis, um, his tendency to take on maverick positions goes back as far as 1976. Now, this is a work of classic Jewish apologetics um, by Rabbi Sachs. Um, and he tells us that he's going to refer to the writings of Ludwig Wittgenstein, the most important single figure in English-speaking philosophy of the century. So what better if you're going to try and support Jewish thought and Jewish theology Let's go to the top, and the top must be Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Now, I don't want to spend time um, going through the thought of Ludwig Wittgenstein, so I'm going to do, this is the later thought of Ludwig Wittgenstein, and I can do this standing on one leg. Um, this picture actually appears in Philosophical Investigations, um, which was published, uh, give or take two years, around 1950, and Wittgenstein drew this magnificent drawing of the duck rabbit. And what I need to ask you is, what can you see? Um, and some of you will say, I can see a very lovely duck with a very lovely beak stretching off to the left. And some of you will say, no, I can see a very lovely bunny rabbit. There's its mouth on the right. 
and its floppy ears have flopped down to the horizontal, and that's why um, he looks uh, slightly strange for a bunny rabbit. Now, and Wittgenstein said that is exactly how we understand the world and how we understand language. Sometimes we can understand the same thing in one way, and sometimes we understand the same thing in another way. And what's crucial um, in all of this is that Wittgenstein and therefore Rabbi Sachs um, would follow this up by saying, well, try and see the duck and rabbit simultaneously. And uh, however much blinking and staring and changing of glasses you're going to do, I'm afraid to say you will not be able to see the duck and the rabbit simultaneously. And that is his sort of uh, parable to how, to how we understand the world. Some people see ducks, some people see rabbits. The rabbit seers cannot see ducks, and the duck seers cannot see rabbits. So um, this is um, a picture of a, a philosopher called D.Z. Phillips, and he was one of the most important um, uh, interpreters of Wittgenstein for religious people. And Wittgenstein came up with this uh, um, um, phrase to, to, to describe how different people see the world differently. He called them language games. So, and, uh, and Phillips explained that there's the religious language game. So when you talk about God existing, it means you know, there is a power that controls our lives and informs us of m morality and ethics and spiritual truth. Um, but if God exists is used by a scientist, it's something that you could find in a test tube or maybe measure with some kind of measuring device. And these are the, the word is means different things to different people. To try and bring them together, says Phillips, you're, you're wasting your time. And Rabbi Sachs um, used this Wittgensteinian idea very much um, in the following way. He would very often say, science asks how, and religion asks why. Uh, uh, over the sort of the later period, he didn't reference Wittgenstein that much on this issue, but it was clearly coming out, and when he was at, um, in Cambridge, the presiding influence was, was Wittgenstein. Um, and it was almost taken for, for granted. And here we have a, a sort of a modern type of ap apologetics. We're using Wittgenstein to try and explain Jewish thought, to try and explain problems in Jewish thought, try and explain the problem of, of the existence of God, the free will, um, problem of evil. All those can be solved um, through this application of external ideas. Um, now, I hopefully we'll have time to come back to Rabbi Sachs. That's definitely not where he, where, where he leaves the issue of relativism and this idea of everyone sees things in a different way. But I'd like to move back. So I, I, I said the medieval period was really, really very, very influenced by this idea that secular ideas are terrific and we need to use or secular or non-Jewish ideas, and we need to use them to support our thinking in, in Judaism. I think the key year is 1492. In 1492, the great center of this synthesizing of Judaism with science and philosophy, the great center where P Jews felt it was really important to try and frame their Judaism in terms of external ideas was obviously Spain and Portugal, and it, it, it ended calamitously. For all that effort we made to try and make sense of Judaism in terms of the society that we lived in, didn't at the end of the day, didn't help at all. It was absolute disaster. And I think from 1492, we see a totally different agenda appearing in Jewish thought. And although it's some years later, um, I've skipped on some 200 years, but we can see it in, in other people as well. But it's really beautifully clear in the Ramchal. So Moshe Chaim Lutzato is living in the 18th century. He's 
um, being chased around Italy and finally to Amsterdam by people who didn't really like his, his ideas so much. They're very nervous that we were having a repetition of the Shabtai Tzvi episode of the middle of the 17th century. But he, he, he writes a, 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 an unbelievable work called Mesilla Sishoim. Um, everyone should read Mesilla Sishoim, even just for the, for the beautiful clarity and insight of the human condition. But the opening words of the Msilat um, Yeshoim, and now can I test your memory? What were the opening words of the Rambam? The Rambam, when he told us that we have to believe in a first being, told us, Yesaid ha Yesaidais v'omud ha So the Ramchal is definitely playing on that, those four words. And again, his four words add up to Yudke Vovke. Yeah. So he's got the Rambam in, in his, in, in his uh, crosshairs. The Rambam says, what do we have to do? We have to lay down. We have to be able to use these philosophical proofs in order to know that God exists. The Ramchal says, I'm not interested in those proofs anymore. I'm not interested in secular philosophy. I'm not interested in Muslim philosophy. I'm not interested in Aristotle. You can keep the whole thing. I'm interested in explaining Jewish ideas within a Jewish context. I don't need to be a magpie. I don't need to go somewhere else. And I think from this time forward, this is a, a very big change from Jewish philosophy as an activity that borrows externally to an activity that, at least in principle, wants to be self-contained. So Jewish thinking is about Jewish ideas. Um, I, I know that the, the Ramchal does say that it, we have to believe in, in, in God at the beginning of Dera Hashem, but um, the fact that here we are at the beginning of Masila Sishoim, and he's, he comes up with something completely different, and I'm sorry I, I've used yellow to, to, to bold um, white, which hasn't been all that successful, so I'll, I'll read it to you. So Yisoda Hasidah Sishoim Shavoda. Right at the beginning of Masilas Hashoim, the base, the, 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 the foundation of Hasidus, of being a, a pious person, Vesharish Avoda, and the roots of our service to our Kaddish Baruch Hu, Atmima, pure service, who? She Yispare Vyisames. And that contrasts, Yispare Vyisames is we clarify. A Yispare is, is um, I don't claim to have grammatic exper expertise. But it seems to me that it, it's, um, I think it's called hit pile, and it's reflective. It's we come to clarify and we come to find the truth. Eight cell ha'adam, that each person has to go on this journey of truth seeking. What are we here for? And I think it stands in stark contrast to the opening of the Rambam. I'm sure the Rambam was aware that he was ushering in a new way of looking at things. Where it's the purpose of our life is what are we here for? What are we supposed to do? Can we understand through Jewish sources uh, what's the point of life? And I'm pretty sure that if you go through the whole of Silas to show him, you won't find Socrates, um, Pythagoras, or even Appleton. It's, a, it's, it's very much a new way of looking at Jewish thinking. Um, and um, if you have a look at the early Hasidic writings, and particularly the writings of um, the Vilna Gaon and Chaim of Velozhin, you see that reflected. So here's a, uh, here's a basic question. What is in the world? What is the world? And that was considered to be an argument between the Hasidim and the Misnagdim, between, um, in particular, Shnei Zalman of Miliadi, who Chabad say is the founder of Chabad, um, and in particular, Rechaim Mivolozhin. What is the world? And I'm not going to go into it too much, but none of them are remotely interested in having a look at external philosophy to look into this, but it, it is a topic that philosophers deal with. Certainly, um, it's, it's something very much that um, Spinoza was interested in, Descartes was interested in, Leibniz was in, interested in, 
um, and a contemporary of Schnee Zalman would have been Kant, he'd have been interested. Not the slightest interest. Um, the discussion here is how do we understand our Kodesh Baruch Hu, his Kvodo Mole Olam, that he fills out the whole world and without him there's, um, there's nowhere else. So how do we understand a world which is entirely HaKadosh Baruch Hu? And um, it may be that um, the Vilna Gaon thought that this was a metaphor, that, the, that it wasn't fully filling the world, and the Hasidim said, no, there is a literal truth in the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is everywhere. These are fundamental philosophical questions that are being answered with only recourse to Jewish ideas, particularly the ideas of the, uh, of the Kabbalah, no suggestion that Jewish philosophy or Jewish thinking, and I, I, I know that um, it may be a surprise to hear that um, Chaim Evolution is a Jewish philosopher, but I, I think he is. He's dealing with these questions. What, what, what is the world? What is God? What is the nature of our relationship? These are bona fide philosophical questions, but he only speaks of them within the context of Jewish sources. So we have a second period where apologetics is definitely out of the window and instead it's replaced by um, Jewish philosophy that looks inwards, that's really only interested in understanding how do Jewish sources answer these questions. Just to finish off with, I'd like to come back to, to Rabbi Sachs because I think he ushers in a third phase, not that this was absent entirely previously. Um, I think Moe Nevuchim uh, fits into this quite well. I think Rav, Rav Hirsch was interested in this. But it's a new question across the, uh, uh, the, the breadth of, of Jewish thinking. Is what can Jewish thought bring to secular philosophy? Not, so we started off, what can secular philosophy bring to Jewish thought? Rabbi Sachs asks a different question. Can Jewish ideas help us deal with the crisis in philosophy of the end of the last century and through into this century? And um, the book in which he deals with this the most, I think, is actually The Politics of Hope, which, is, has, as we'll see, has a lot of Jewish sources. But it also filters through to morality. Um, and I've taken this um, front cover of a, something called a summary of morality. And just to show you that I do own the original thing. It's over here. But the strap line doesn't do very well on the um, black cover. Whereas here, the strap line is crucially important. It's restoring the common good in divided times. So, and I think Rabbi Kimchi mentioned this. There is a problem coming out of the post-Wittgenstein world, but it's not only Wittgenstein, it's the um, French tradition that goes through, through people like Foucault and Lacan, where there is no truth. Um, we are living in divided times. No one knows what the truth is. How can we have a morality that is common to us all? So that strap line is really what the book's about, restoring the common good in divided times. And in an, in an earlier article, it was a review of a book by Terry Eagleton, um, I think Rabbi Sachs summed it up absolutely brilliantly. We are surrounded by choices, but we have no reason to choose this rather than that. It's a fantastic sum summary of where philosophy, the mess that philosophy had got itself into by... Um, by really, let's say, 1950 or 1960, but maybe even before that, and still hasn't worked its way. We're surrounded by choices. Everything is true, you know, um, relativism. We, we like every different type of society, and we say that you can't criticize this society unless you, you've been in it and you understand it. But then how do we choose anything? How, how is, is anything right or is anything wrong? Um, and... Um, Rabbi Sachs has now sort of discarded uh, Wittgenstein and he's replaced it with McIntyre. And McIntyre has this idea that, well, let's see whether, what, what, what idea McIntyre has. Let's leave that alone. Um, 
here. Um, McIntyre's idea is the way to create a common morality, the way to create the, the mess that philosophy has got itself into is I can only answer the question, what am I to do? If I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself a part? So I am only, I'm only a being who is part of what he calls a narrative. We might call it a community. It's our community that defines us. And by letting our community define us, define us, us then, um, then we can start answering philosophical questions. But um, I just want to show you how in, so Rabbi Sachs is very taken with the ideas of, of McIntyre. But he says, hey, you know what? I can bring to play Jewish ideas, very specifically Jewish ideas, and I can help you, McIntyre. I can show you why it is that communities succeed, communities have morality, and individuals can't. So this is a Gemara in Bob Basra, which he, he quotes in Politics of Hope. It's the story of Rabbi Shua ben Gamla. And without going into the whole, whole thing, Rabbi Shua ben Gamla arrives at a time when Jewish education is the responsibility of fathers or families. It's not a broader responsibility, and it just doesn't work. For whatever reason, if you, only, if you leave families to deal with Jewish education and not society, then those who are already advantaged will continue being advantaged, and those who are not advantaged will never become advantaged. And this is obviously a message for today as we try and work out whether to go back to school tomorrow. Do, do we reinforce disadvantage? Um, or do we take a different view? So Rav Shur Ben Gamla realized the, um, the importance of destroying unfair advantage. And therefore, he, is, he established uh, right at the bottom, Moshivin Malamde Tinokos Bechol Mundino Mundino Bechol Ir Ve'ir. There was a, a local school everywhere. Umachnisen Esonka Ben Sheish Ben Sheva. And children would go there as young as six or seven. So Rabbi Sachs says, you want to understand why society is important because society can deal with disadvantage, society can deal with education, individuals can't deal with disadvantage. Or um, this is something he quotes in, in morality about how important society and community is. It's um, more in Brochus. So Rebchia wasn't feeling well. So he went to Reb Yochanan. How are you coping with all, all your pain? So he says to him, I really don't want the, the pain. So Reb Yochanan says, okay, I'll make you feel better. Give me your hand. Let's get connected. And Rebchia felt better. So Reb Yochanan is someone who can cure people. Rabbi Yochanan Cholosh, in turn, Rabbi Yochanan becomes ill. Olagabe Rabbi Chanina, and he goes to Rabbi Chanina, Amalecha, even Alecha Yisuin, and the same conversation. Do you want to, you know, how do you feel about all this pain? Amale, I don't want the pain. Lahein v'loischoran, Amale, havli yodcha. So in turn, now this is Rabbi Chanina speaking to Rabbi Yochanan, who was able to cure people, but he goes to Rabbi Chanina, havli yodcha yavle yade ve'okme, and Rabbi Chanina was able to cure Rabbi Yochanan. So given the fact that Rabbi Yochanan has established himself as having the power to, cu to cure, am I like in Rabbi Yochanan l'nafshe? Why didn't Rabbi Yochanan heal himself? So the conclusion is, Amri, ein chovush matia asmaim beisasurim, an individual prisoner can't free himself from um, captivity. An individual can't, can't even help himself and certainly can't help society. Um, an individual can't help himself. However, if we gang together, if we get Reb Chia and Reb Yochanan and Reb Chanina, they between them can make everyone, uh, 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 can, can make them all feel, feel better. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, if I know how to do that. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and let me just sort of s sum up. 
Um, the, the sum up is, is Jewish philosophy Jewish? Well, probably at the beginning, it wasn't so Jewish. Is that terrible? Um, the Rambam, the Barbanel, and the Ramban um, had their cheshbonus as to why they thought it was important to establish Jewish thinking very much leaning on Muslim sources. In the, in the middle period, we, particularly through the influence of the Kabbalah, we start thinking only in Jewish terms. And then we have this remarkable contribution of, of Rabbi Sachs and others in the much later period, where we're going to take these Jewish ideas and we're actually going to turn them back on broader society and see if we can help broader society understand the, the mess that it's got itself in by looking through, um, broad, uh, by looking through Jewish sources. So the answer to the question is yes and no and sometimes, if that's uh, going to be a, a reasonable answer. And um, with that, I'm going to hand back to Rabbi Zobin. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that uh, tour de force, really, uh, uh, an illuminating summary of the uh, three stages of, uh, in the Jewish relationship to philosophy and uh, helping us contextualize uh, Rabbi Sachs in the great tradition of Jewish thinking and uh, Jewish philosophy. And that brings to an end our morning learning session. Um, I'll just use this chance though to plug uh, the continued rich programming that we have in there of Shurim. Um, really a very, very full schedule of Shurim. Uh, they've been quiet for the last couple of weeks with uh, the breaks, but they are restarting this week and next week, including Sunday morning uh, philosophy, Monday evening textual Shurim, um, Wednesday evening Pasha and Halacha, the ongoing Dafayomi Shurim, given by Rabbi Michael Pollock and so much else. Um, so please avail yourself of these. Um, our next Yom Limud will include uh, international speakers. It will be a pre-Purim Yom Limud on Sunday, February the 14th. So uh, save the date where we will have international speakers, including Yael Leibovitz, Rabbi Isaacson, Rabbi Turetsky, um, fascinating and fantastic international speakers for our next Sunday morning Yom Limud. And in the meantime, thank you all so much for joining. And uh, I wish everyone only good health and looking forward to continuing learning Torah together.